effectively what we'll do in the in the next hour is we'll start with a uh, asking uh, Liz Lewis to give us a, a bit of an overview of the project and then we'll look forward to having a, a more open discussion and we can introduce the rest of the the team perhaps Liz what once you've once you've given our everyone a bit of a flavor for what what pyramid is so uh, without further ado thank you very much and over to you thanks Ewan. Great. So, um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about the Pyramid Project, um, which is really looking at trying to model the dynamic aspects of flood modelling. Um, so our kind of current operational models are based on kind of static topography, but there are really kind of evolving um, things that happen during a flood. And one of the things that we're primarily focusing on in this project is the movement of debris uh, during a flood. Um, a really stark example of this is the flash flood in 2004 in Boscastle, um, where we had very heavy rainfall falling on a very steep sided catchment. And um, this created kind of a, a wall of water coming down the valley. And critically, before it hit the village, it went through a car park, which had over 100 cars parked in it. And um, it suspended those cars, washed them down the valley. They blocked a bridge uh, which caused water to back up and then the kind of bridge failed and then washed everything down and this caused a lot more damage uh, to the village than uh, would have happened previously. Um, we see this on a uh, kind of uh, smaller scales as well. So debris is really prevalent in causing nuisance floods. Um, so often you'll get lots of kind of woody debris or bins or rubbish coming through and blocking culverts um, and kind of trash screens and things like that, causing uh, water to back up in kind of smaller uh, areas as well. So debris really plays an important uh, part in flooding and we don't really capture this dynamic aspect of uh, flooding in our current models. Um, we do have the capability to model this. So um, Chiu Alang, who's on the project and his team have developed a model called Pipins over the years, um, which is able to uh, model the movement of debris and how this affects um, evolving flood risk. Um, but this hasn't really been used operationally because um, it requires so much data and extra information to be able to actually do. Um, and so this is what we've really been looking at in Pyramid. We've been building a platform that allows us to uh, run this uh, kind of debris flood model. Um, and to be able to do that, we need lots of extra information. So we use a physically based hydrological model to provide the boundary conditions to the, the flood model. So this gives us kind of the river flows and the water coming in uh, at the boundary of the city that we're looking at. Um, and we also have um, a kind of machine learning model that will detect objects that could float during a flood. So this is taking satellite imagery and point cloud data to uh, actually identify where cars and trees are so that we can um, put those into the flood model and see how they move around during a flood. Um, all of these obviously require a whole lot of data, and so we're getting our data from multiple sources. We're getting our kind of official um, data from uh, Met the Met Office and the Environment Agency, so uh, lots of our agencies that are collecting uh, lots of data to a high standard. Um, but we're also supplementing that with really dense sensor networks from places like the Urban Observatory or the National Green Infrastructure Facility, which have hundreds of sensors over Newcastle city centre, which is where we are doing our kind of uh, test of this modeling platform. Um, we also use community data and citizen science data to feed into this to add even more uh, data into the system. And um, so uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing is getting all of that data into the platform and bringing it all together. We've had to think of kind of clever ways to merge this data together and make sure that it's of uh, a good enough quality to drive these models. Um, so because there's so much data there and so many models going on, um, we've tried to consolidate this into a, a really easy to use um, visualizing tool. Um, so what you can see here is uh, all of the input data sources being displayed. So this is things like rainfall data and trash bean um, visualizations. And um, then you can have a look at the outputs from the different models. So this is the output of the floating object detection model. So you can see all the cars that have been identified as part of um, that model. Um, you can have a look at the river flow. So this is the model output from the hydrological model um, where each of these are a, a river link and you can see how the flows change throughout the simulation. Um, and you can also kind of click on one of these 
cells and have a look at a time series of the data as well. So we can uh, look at this in a really interactive way and zoom in on the areas of interest. And then ultimately what we're really interested in is looking at the, uh, the changing flood extents and depths uh, of flooding uh, in the city center, which is what we see here. Um, to do this, we obviously require a massive project team because we're drawing on so many different areas of expertise. Um, lots of uh, the people as part of this team are here today on the call. So um, Haley and I have a uh, specialism in uh, kind of hydrological modeling, and that's what uh, Ben Smith is doing. Uh, Eleanor and Claire have been uh, working on the kind of community citizen science aspect. Um, John Wen, Shidong and Maria have been doing the computer vision and developing the machine learning algorithms to uh, identify these floating objects. Um, Chua and Zhu are working on the actual hydrodynamic model um, and the uh, debris modeling. And then uh, Robin and Amy have been working on getting all of this data together and building the kind of software platform that is needed to do it. Um, we also work with a whole range of uh, project partners and stakeholders um, who have been uh, really valuable in kind of giving us insight into uh, what a, a platform like this uh, would need to do and also how we can make it useful and valuable, as well as um, helping them think of ways that they can visualize their data and kind of leverage their data into a really useful system. Uh, and that's my brief overview of Pyramid. Well, um, Liz, th thanks ever so much for that. That's it's great to get that sort of initial overview of the of the project and the the, the focus of it, and, and and of course all the stakeholders you're working with, and, and the focus really are, is on Newcastle as you as you as you've outlined. So it'll be interesting to see just how some of the approaches that you're demonstrating can be perhaps applied in in wider context. I uh, thank thanks also for in, introducing uh, all the colleagues here. There's a, a whole range of the project team here. And I, I think one of the fascinating things about projects of this type and this, this magnitude is the, the range of different skills that, the, that need to be reflected in the team. So it's a very interdisciplinary team, but, um, you know, research software engineers, hydrologists, um, a, whole, a whole range of folk looking at demographic data and the Im impacts as well. Um, Professor Haley Fowler, you're, 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 you're the uh, originator and PI of this, and then Liz is sitting with you driving this forward. I mean, I wonder if we perhaps could start with you following that um, introduction, just to ask you to give a, a bit of a feeling for the, you know, what, what is the, the, the big challenge you've, you've really been trying to address in, in this project and um, how it affects on, on society? And also, you know, what, what what is the magnitude of the of the sort of problems that you're you're addressing? Um, so Liz gave a really great summary of the project there, um, and it's very much around trying to improve, I suppose, the immediate management of flooding. So the ultimate aim is to provide information um, at near real time or eventually real time um, for people like emergency services, etc., to make decisions about, um, you know, what perhaps which roads are open, perhaps um, where problems may have been focused around um, bringing lots of new data sets together, as Liz has already um, mentioned, um, and very much focused around floating debris in particular um, and trying to model that, but within a near real-time setting. Um, so, I mean, I think it's flooding, flooding is really a very much an increasing issue in the UK and around the world. Um, and in particular, the sort of floods that affect cities and city centres and urban settings in particular are mainly caused in the summer, mainly from um, these big convective storms. And we expect those to increase substantially, both in frequency and um, intensity in the future. So we're going to see more of these flooding type events and, and really this is about how do we manage these events while they're occurring um, and can we provide information in near real time as I say ultimately it would be good to to try and provide this information in real time um, and and this project is really very much a demonstrator of how you would do that in a city um, which can then be rolled out hopefully to other cities across the UK and potentially you know elsewhere as well. That, re that near real time is uh, aspect is so important. There's no, no no use knowing that your house flooded 
a while ago. It's uh, to, so for people to take action, for authorities to to take action. So that's that's a real strength of this. And I guess you know you've been able. We'll come to some of the technologies that are enabling that later in our discussion. But that's clearly a a huge strength then of of what you've you've tried to do with this project. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, it's, I mean, it, it, I suppose the, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the computing capabilities because um, peop, other people in the team are much more expert than me about this. Um, but very much it's something that has, you know, computing power has improved substantially over the last five years or so, um, enabling this sort of approach to be taken now. And I know that you are... Liang and his team at Loughborough have demonstrated this in previous projects as well. We, we certainly did some work in um, the Sinatra and Tenderly projects um, where we de they demonstrated very much that a real-time approach was, was possible um, for the uh, Storm Desmond event, for example. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's trying to bring all of these models together on a pl platform to actually do this in real time is quite different from, I suppose, demonstrating this for an event. Mm. So getting involved with Daphne and um, producing a platform that people can then use um, beyond the project, and hopefully, you know, this will be taken up and used as well, um, then, then, you know, that's quite exciting, really. D Daphne being the data and analytics for national infrastructure platform, which is uh, on, on, the, on the web, we, people can find out about that. And I'm just wondering, perhaps for yourself, and indeed uh, opening out to other members of the, the team, a lot of the thrust of the, the the work here has been around this concept of digital environment, and I'm I'm just wondering if you know what what your collective take is on uh, digital environments, and and how, how do you how, what is what is it about uh, the environment the challenges that you have that means the digital approach is the is the appropriate way to to progress. I, I'm going to pass this over to Liz. Now, Liz is acting PI of this project, and she's very excited about the digital environment. So I'm going to let her answer this. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, I think we've got, so, I mean, what's really exciting now is we've got the computing power to be able to um, uh, run kind of complex models. Um, we've got really well-developed physically-based models of the environment, and we're beginning to uh, get together whole suites of data that we can use to drive those models. So I think we're kind of in the era of testing, um, you know, bringing everything together in one place and the challenges that we've really faced in Pyramid and that and in other projects that I've been part of um, have really been about, you know, just the kind of the glue <laughs> for everything uh, together. So that. Yeah, I think that's kind of the, the big thing that we've had to overcome here. There's so much available and um, that it, we just need to kind of bring it together and make it coherent and see what is possible and what is not possible um, currently um, so that we can start making innovations in the right areas. Yeah, thanks. I, I, so there's some other points that we, we might um, come back to, um, but I think we, we've spoken about data and, and date, this is a very data heavy project clearly, but you also, of course, then have the technologies that sit around that data to to process it across this arc that, that was mentioned earlier. The, um, the, the the processing chain. I mean, per, per, can we just have a bit of an overview of what what sorts of technologies? And maybe maybe Robin, if I may turn turn to you, what what sort of technologies are you using to uh, address this challenge? Uh, yes. Um, so. Um, well, one, one interesting aspect of the project is that <clears throat> somebody like me is involved. Uh, so I'm a research software engineer, um, and that's it's a relatively new discipline in, in um, research. Um, it's only been around 10 years. So the, <clears throat> the scale of the computing challenge has increased sufficiently that um, dedicated software engineers uh, really need to be involved in these kind of projects now. Um, so... Uh, you mentioned Daphne earlier on. Um, the kind of the, the, the challenge with the project like this, and as Liz has just mentioned uh, there, really, which is about bringing everything together all in one pl one place. Um, <clears throat> there are multiple um, multiple simulators involved in this. So uh, I mentioned the Sheetran simulator and Hypim simulator. They're both very complex pieces of um, software in themselves. Uh, there are a lot of different conversions that need to be done for data um, between uh, different pieces of the technology chain. There's the um, object detection technology, 
<clears throat> again, it's a machine learning technology. It's very complex and needs a lot of data. And I think traditionally, certainly in the university research environment, it's been quite a struggle to get those kind of things all together in one place. Different data formats, different, um, you know, even ways of interpreting data, different ways of thinking about running programs. Um, what might have happened is that uh, people might have used HPC that has its own problems about, about access and um, jobs have to be queued. They might, you might expect to run jobs for quite a long time in HPC, it's a time sharing system. So, um, and the other aspect of, about this project is that we're not co-located either. So we, there's a, there's a, there are colleagues in Loughborough, we're in Newcastle. I'm not in the same part of the university as, um, as Liz's team. <clears throat> I'm a civil engineer and I work in a different building. So, um, so we've used Daphne um, as, a, as, as our platform. Um, so Daphne offers the solution to those kind of things, which is to um, co-locate simulation and data storage. So Daphne, Daphne, uh, I won't go into the details of, of how it's constructed, but it's a <clears throat> it's a platform which allows you to host uh, data. It has a huge data store; it's petabytes of data it can it can handle, um, and that's one of its prime purposes. Really, is to host data sets which can be used for national research. Um, so it sounds like these. Projects of this sort of nature need a, a new generation of platform, really, to, to, really. to operate it. So, you know, maybe just give a quick pen picture of what Daphne is then. Yeah, so it, it can host, um, um, it, it, it's centered around four components, really, uh, data storage and models. So a model is essentially a program which transforms data from one form to another. And it can be as simple as a, a a Python script which copies some data from one form to another, or it can be a full simulator like Hypens. And uh, then a workflow. <clears throat> so the workflow allows you to chain models together. Um, so you can pass data from one model to another and, and transform the data into from, you know, from uh, raw measurements into some kind of uh, simulation output like the, the flood levels. Um, and then visualization is the final component of it. Um, so something which allows you to actually see what it is you've produced. So we've we've used those um, components to to host our. I think that that diagram that Liz showed earlier, um, the data coming into the project is composed of static and dynamic data. The static data can be hosted within Daphne, um, and uh, dynamic data can be pulled from APIs like the Environment Agency or Urban Observatory. Uh, external sensor APIs. So those <clears throat> those components feed into our models. Yeah. Um, Robin, Robin, I see I see there's some questions from colleagues coming in on the on the Q and A, and thank you very much to everyone for for posing those. And let, let's have some more. And maybe a question to you, and indeed opening out to wider members of the team here. A question about the sources of the data that you're you're drawing together for this project, and um, in particular the the question from Rutger, thank you, is about the debris that's um, recorded. Could you expand on the, the sources of data? And, and in fact, would such data be available in other places? I, I don't know if other, other colleagues on the from the team would like to address this as well. Yeah, Amy, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, sure. Uh, so in terms of the data for the debris um, at the moment, we're using a combination of different sources, um, which um, things like satellite and LIDAR data, um, which I guess will be available in other places. Um, and a lot of the way of getting this data is through kind of like um, machine learning algorithms. So that, um, I guess, will be available elsewhere. Um, what was the question? Sorry. Oh, it's just, it's really about the the sources of the data, particularly debris, Amy, and, and um, where that's coming from. So I, I'm, I'm thinking from what was said earlier, this might be to do with machine vision, um, but I'm, I'm just guessing there. Is, where, where does the debris data come from? Yeah, so a lot of it, so what we do is identify kind of a bounding box for, so a good example is vehicle data. So for the cars, we identify a bounding box, which will get a score, so you'll know how likely it is that it's a car. And then from that bounding box, we have to source in additional information. So we've got things like 
you've got a big car data set that then you can look at the kind of width and length of a car and it can identify things like the weight which you need for the debris modeling um, so a lot of it is combining different data sets um, and in terms of the um, so we're also trying to consider woody debris um, and we're going to look at getting uh, we've been working with um, other partners to include a model that will kind of look at areas that we've identified as trees and kind of give a almost probability that that would result in woody debris and um, both not Hi. Thank you very much, Amy. Shihua, mm -hmm. I see you are nodding vigorously there. Did you have some comments on, on that on that sort of approach? Well, I mean, I mean, for, for the debris, obviously, this is one of the um, uh, very big challenge in terms of, you know, <clears throat> getting accurately, I think, where the debris was, you know, whether that would be moved, something like that. So I think uh, in this team, you know, we more or less, you know, using data from multiple sources. So from, you know, for example, from remote sensing, you know, or, you know, from the CCTV, you know, you know, more or less, you know, where we capture this kind of debris. And then, you know, I think the great team in Newcastle, they use this like a deep machine learning approach to identify them and then the shape and the size and also the probability of moving and things like that. And then that, you know, can put in a feed into our model and then our model can you know, simulate, you know, I think according to the type, you know, size of, of the debris and then whether that would be moved by the uh, flow dynamics, if move and then how that, you know, follow the uh, flow dynamics and then, you know, I think, uh, I, I think throughout the, the process and then whether interact with um, like infrastructure building, you know, like bridge, uh, like, you know, with, uh, 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 leads, I think mentioned about Box, Box Castle and then to, to basically, I think, to assess the flow risk, including this kind of extra, you know, component in the story. So, because this is not really like, been done in the um, uh, uh, current uh, risk assessment or management practice. So more or less, I think for pyramid, I think uh, what we're doing here, it's uh, like, you know, let's mention super exciting. We more or less are bridging the current technology, you know, with the future technology, you know, that, that means you know, that's a forefront of the today's technology, whether mm -hmm. that can be put into practice you know, for example, for EA, for flood forecasting center to uptake, to save life. If you look at in the last year, you know, I think the year before last year, the event in, in, in Germany and not only in China, that killed oh. hundreds of people. And this kind of technology in near real time, that can really help, you know, I think a decision maker, the public, really to, you know, kind of see the risk and then to manage themselves, really. Yeah. I, I was going to mention that the, the um, incredible pictures from China with the underground stations filling up and, of course, the Rhine flooding that systems like this clearly if as Haley, Haley as you say if they can be made real time could be a tremendous boost <clears throat> but just sticking with the data for a minute so I'm okay. hearing um, you have CCTV you're looking at machine vision using AI approaches to extract objects and so that that's you know classify those and you also have presumably existing data sets like the outlines of buildings the curb heights and and then you have projections of uh, rainfall and so on but one of, the, one of the things I'm intrigued by and uh, in the introduction, uh, Liz, that you gave was a, a discussion about the hundreds and hundreds of sensors that are out there. And I'm just wondering, to, you know, team, how you, how you integrate sensor data arising from all these different environmental sensors and, and fold that into the modeling. Would anyone like to, Robin, perhaps you, you, you could give us a, a view on that. Yeah, I just um, I wanted to go back a little bit actually to the, um, the floating debris. Um, so the, the main approach at the minute is a satellite, um, probably speaking for Shidong here, but it's, a, um, it's an identification of bounding boxes, as Amy said, from satellite imagery. <clears throat> and then there's Shidong's and who's working on, the, on another uh, approach at the minute, which is identification of objects from point cloud data. And if a, pro if a general approach like this to near real-time environmental disaster prediction is really becomes really important. It does raise big questions about how you get data like that timely, because we don't have a very timely feed of satellite data. So we don't actually know what it what we could get at the minute, but it's certain, there's certainly not like a real time feed of satellite data. Um, one of the one of the um, limitations would be bandwidth, just purely transferring the um, satellite imagery bandwidth to something like Daphne and then analyzing it. So that's a big kind of open question, I think, at the minute. So the, I think it's showing that the, um, the importance of having an analysis of floating object and, and debris data is, is, is there. But whether we, whether we can get the data um, 
of sufficient quality in a timely fashion to be able to analyze it is, a, is another matter. And I think we've, we've only just started to broach that. And that's a bigger question for national infrastructure, really, and, and data provision. Yeah, definitely. It feeds into the sensor um, question as well. So, uh, um, so the way that we try to bring all these different data sets and to take rainfall as an example is, um, so the urban observatory has um, kind of rain gauges around the city and it also has uh, radar data. Um, we've got our kind of community uh, science uh, collected rainfall data as well as the Met Office and Environmental, uh, uh, the EA gauge data too. So one of the big challenges is actually thinking about um, uh, how we bring all of those different data sets together into one driving rainfall data set for the various models. Um, and as Robin's just said, the reliability of that data in near real time is really, really um, variable as well. So something that we, uh, we can't just focus on just the kind of blending method that we use. We have to think about how that is adapted to the current available rainfall um, from various sources at any given time step. So it kind of has to, um, yeah, change uh, for each time step, depending on what is available. So uh, it's a really a big kind of outcome of the project has been thinking about uh, increasing the reliability and density of the various input data sources to the platform. So many things you've had to grapple with. I mean, you've got all these different types of data coming in. You've got different temporal frequencies, different different scales and so on. It's it's a, it's a real challenge that you face, and it so, sounds like the, the, the Daphne tool is, is the thing to, to support that. Um, I, I, I see that Jill Thompson, thank you for your question, um, has just posed a, a challenge, which I, I think actually it's something we've just been discussing about, have you a source of data on the potential for different tree species to be upro uprooted? or broken up in a, in a flood to create the woody debris in the first place. And, and also regarding cars, how, um, how well cars are sealed to prevent water ingress, which would affect how likely they are to float. I don't know whether, whether certain types of cars are, are better floaters than others, but um, do, do, you, do you have that sort of metadata around the, the data you're collecting? No, definitely not. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. A, a quick comment in here. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's a, actually a good, a good question. I think uh, um, in terms of whether we can really like simulate or forecast or predict real world as it is. I think there's a there's a big question, big scientific actually question actually to answer. The answer obviously, you know, for, for some of the cases like this one, because in there here is not, because we can't really like simulate exactly what happened in the real world. For example, you know, like is that a car seal or not seal? And then that would, you know, I think turn down into, I think, a different story in terms of the floating and things like that. But yeah. with, you know, with, uh, for example, with the data, we can identify, for example, thousands of cars out there. And then statistically, we can, you know, uh, I can simulate out a, a good story, you know, telling where the risk is, you know, whether, you know, you know, I think, I think uh, uh, the possibility of that. So that's, you know, what we're doing here. We're dealing with a, a kind of chaotic system in the real world because the modeling results are highly sensitive, you know, to this kind of initial, you know, a condition of the objects and, and things like that. But again, when doing for some scenarios, you know, a forecasting or, you know, working on this kind of statistic, way of you know simulating multiple events, multiple scenarios, and then we can keep a good story so that you know I think uh, to reflect the wish in the in real world. Yeah. So that's I hope a, that's, a yeah, that's, a, that's a interesting perspective. Uh, I mean I guess you you have to challenge you have a challenge about whether you you look at specific like car brands or whether you take a, an average position or or adopt a sort of worst case position. And there's lots of strategies I guess you you'd have to think about in in doing that. Indeed. But, yeah. Um you know, we, we heard earlier about the, you know, the, the dreadful floods last last year in, in the Rhineland and in, in China, that's very much on the news, and, and of course in, in Pakistan and other, other parts of the world, as you say, it seems to be a, 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 a phenomena of the times we live in. Um, just, just um, it's so important that authorities have, a, have, the, have this information at their, their disposal to, to try to address these issues when they come up. And, now I'm just wondering, really, what what the scope of the policy engagement is that this this project's had. You you showed a, a wide range of stakeholders in the presentation. Uh, thanks for that. But um, you know, ha, ha, what what's planned for the future in this in this in that arena? 
I definitely think that this is more of a, a kind of operational tool rather than a high level policy tool. So um, the way that I see it interacting with policy is more to shape the uh, kind of national strategies around data collection and um, kind of uh, computing provision uh, rather than uh, that this uh, tool definitely currently would give kind of policy relevant outputs. It's definitely more of an operational tool to help uh, the environment agency or lead local flood authorities, things like that. Um, uh, but the kind of the, I mean, the beauty of doing a demonstrator project is we've really had a go at seeing, you know, pushing everything to its limits. We've pushed Daphne to its limits. We've pushed all the data to its limits, pushed our models to their limits. Um, and then just kind of showing, really forcing <laughs> to show where all the gaps are in our various uh, kind of uh, facilities and, and data sets and things like that. So I think that from this, we're going to have a really uh, interesting perspective piece on what needs to be done to make a, a digital environment um, actually feasible. And that will be the main kind of impact on policy I see coming from this. It sounds like you've had a lot of interest from stakeholders. I mean, do you, do you get a, a sense that uh, these sorts of digital tools might play a part in future uh, policy responses uh, or, or indeed sort of almost uh, tactical responses as well as strategic responses? Yeah, I think something like this would really um, benefit from being a central resource that's maybe run by someone like the Flood Forecasting Centre or the Environment Agency. Um, kind of the the power of it will come from bringing in more and more uh, different data sets and assets um, that kind of interact with each other. So I think one of the particular challenges of uh, building kind of digital twins for the digital environment, as opposed to a digital twin for um, modeling an engine or something like that is like Chiwa said, just kind of the, the chaos <laughs> um, and how interconnected everything is in the real world. So um, if we, I could see this being used as kind of a central operational resource that people bring their data sets to that gives us a, a better kind of uh, detail in the landscape of how things will interact with each other and then provide better information to everybody who's affected um, by flood risk. I'm, I'm interested, you, you've, you've raised the, the sort of theme of digital twins and, um, you know, this is clearly an area which is, which is gaining quite a lot of traction in, in the environmental sciences at the moment. And, and this, you know, following on the heels of established approaches in, in engineering and medicine and other, other applications. What, what, what's your take on digital twins and, and have, you, have you developed a digital twin or what, what, what would need to happen to make your approach a digital twin in the future? It's a yeah. question to all of you, really. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I, I think this is kind of towards a digital twin rather than actually being a digital twin. We've definitely not closed the loop of, um, you know, kind of data to models to then kind of the action that is automated at that end of the digital twin process. Um, but it has been a big enough challenge getting to this stage <laughs> where we're actually bringing to everything together uh, in, a, in a platform. So I think there's a long way to go for making digital twins uh, in the environment as opposed to uh, kind of some of the other areas. I don't know if anyone else has yeah. thoughts. I think there's, a, there's an interesting question about um, what near real time or real time is, because uh, we've, we've had this discussion where if it was, if it was real time, uh, say, take no, say it took no computational time to evaluate the, uh, the simulation, then you could look out the window and see what, what's going on. So that's actually not useful to have a real time simulation of flooding that needs to be prior to it, so it's more predictive. Um, but we don't. I don't think we quite know where that boundary is at the minute. And then, <clears throat> then what we can study from a digital twin in terms of how accurate, say, these car models are, or, or woody debris, and how accurately it reflects the real real world. I think that's a little way away yet. I mean, I suppose one of the, one thing is uh, where you where, where one tries different scenarios and and um, maybe planning decisions for the future could be run through this model to see you know what what sense it would make to place this economic development or these these housing uh, plans in a particular area and, and uh, that that's you know that's a challenge yeah i think we've been thinking about um uh pyramid in kind of 
different um, use cases. So we've probably chosen the most difficult use case of trying to do things in near real time um, because that, you know, just bringing all of that data in uh, in near real time is really difficult. We've been thinking about it in terms of kind of forecast mode, um, which would be a bit more straightforward because it would just be driven kind of with a single or a kind of an ensemble of forecasts coming from the Met Office. Um, but then again, uh, for we could also run it in kind of historic mode with kind of a complete historic data sets rather than this patchy real time data. Um, but and also kind of with longer term projections um, for uh, how weather might change, which could be used for planning. I think what's really neat about what we've done is we've used physically based models at the heart of it, which makes it as flexible as possible um, for uh, using it in all of these different modes. Um, so if you did want to test a kind of building flood defenses or natural flood management and things like that, we've got the the models are the most flexible kind of model that you could use and we could build all of that into the platform so um yeah it's been really interesting thinking about the potential futures for a tool like this I mean, when you when you bring together all these different data all these different data types from different sources you've just mentioned a range of different sources um the the met office and, and so on different temporal scales ge geographical scales and how do you deal with the different confidences that you have and and does that does that follow through into the the confidence that you have in the in the projections that the the models are, are giving you how do, how do you deal with uncertainty as it as it passes through the the processing chain i mean is it right at the end do you know it's right <laughs> yeah oh, actually, i do want to answer this yeah, I think I think I think that probably go back to you know the um, um, the question we we discussed you know I think a, a, a few minutes ago regarding the uncertainty you know of the data things like that obviously so obviously we all know that no no modeling result or you know, forecasting result you know actually you know hundred percent reflecting the real world that's a problem however we you know in in the, in, a, in practice and also you know scientific community we do have some approach you know to deal with uncertainty for example ensemble you know forecasting. Which is in, in practical you know operation now. I think the 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 the, the, the great thing about pyramid is you know uh, like Liz already mentioned we are not really digital twin yet but we'll be towards him, you know that you know that direction. And then more importantly, it's to identify you know where you know I think we're reaching there. Where is the gap? You know and what is the um, a different part of human data side modeling side? What are the you know the, uh, basically different between you know the different components so that we can match each other. So I think to handle this kind of, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think going back to the uncertainty. So if we have a system like this, now we can model, you know, floating the breeze, we can model cars, you know, I think, uh, you know, moving around the city, we can even move in, you know, if we, we, we can even simulate the social dynamics, like how people moving around, we got model like that now. But and then, you know, we fit this a system and then we can test different scenarios, you know, I think because now we're running on high performance computing that can really make it in a near real time, for example, if a, a council or, you know, or, or organization would like to know, you know, the emergency planning, you know, plans, for example, ABC, and then what the consequence would be, and then they can test it out, you know, using system we're building here, for example, and they say, okay, plan A would be better, you know, in this, and then plan B may be, you know, save more people, but, you know, damage more economic, and then they can test out and then to, to give them information, you know, to do the, um, you know, I think, I think decision again, and if we, we, we run, you know, multiple, you know, scenarios, and then we can calculate the, uh, the statistic and then to, you know, really identify, you know, or, you know, I think uh, more or less and look into the uncertainty part. So I think that, so there's no 100% accuracy, accuracy, but we can play, you know, or understand the, uh, the, the uh, uncertainty and then, you know, build it into decision making, you know, because all the decision making is under uncertainty. So, you know, we need to really like, you know, balance that, yeah. The Good, uncertainty right. question is yeah. really important, but I think uh, there's so much work that has to happen before you can address that. <laughs> so we've spent, Two and a half years and we've just kind of got a complete workflow where you can even begin to start running these kinds of simulations the the technical details and the kind of software engineering behind uh building something like this is a, an absolutely enormous challenge so it's a really important question but there's a lot that needs to be done before you can start getting there Haley, yes please yeah i i, I think i think there's a bit of a philosophical question here as well actually um, I mean, if we're talking about digital twins, it's kind of um, what one thing, I suppose, in terms of perhaps, as you were saying, scenario planning, thinking about 
future plans? How, how do you reduce flood risk in cities? You can put in future climate scenarios or whatever and have a look at what how you would manage that, um, those changes um, or those risks. Um, but I think when, you, when you're talking about sort of near real time as well, um, it's, it's almost how accurate do you need to be? Um, and I think one of the reasons that we're quite keen to closely work with, with, with stakeholders and with citizen science as well is to try and understand what people need. Because actually, you know, we can produce all singing, all dancing models, but at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, maybe we don't need to, to, to have quite that level of state of the art, actually. And perhaps some of those things as scientists that we think are important to include in the model perhaps aren't that important, actually, um, for managing floods. So I think that, you know, there has to be a balance. You know, as scientists, we're really interested in pushing, pushing the boundaries of, of, of that modelling and that science and bringing in as many data sets as we can, perhaps. But at the, you know, it might be that a more streamlined approach would be more appropriate for stakeholders. So, you know, this is very much a pilot demonstrator, mm. as I've said before. Um, and, you know, as Liz was saying, we thought very much about how we might move this forwards to, to think about a pyramid two or kind of, you know, an extension. There's very many ways we could take this, which I think has come out of the discussion. Um, but, but to be practically useful, it very much has to be co-created with, with stakeholders. I think that's that's a really important point. You know how, how good how good is good enough, and and the answer is it depends. You know on on the the stakeholders and the sorts of challenges that they're they're facing. Is that is that interface between science and policy, which which is interesting. The 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 requirements of the decision makers and the ability of scientists to provide almost tailored packaged information to to support those decisions in in that decision making process. Um. I mean, I think I think this is this has been a, a, a really interesting discussion. I, I'm uh, we started off by talking about digital environment, and um, I, I suppose you know the the interesting thing is what what strides we're making in in constructing a, a, a digital environment, and um, you know what what are the what are the the challenges that we've we've found out? You've you've, you've explained several of the challenges, but. What would you say are the main challenges that are outstanding that remain in in the constructing a digital environment? To, to anyone really on the on the group? <laughs> well, I definitely think um, data reliability, um, density, uh, and uh, yeah, kind of being available uh, easily and uh, in a timely manner is really important. Um, improving the quality of the data that's being provided as well, um, because the, uh, the data comes to us in really variable uh, states of quality. Um, there are some really kind of key missing processes and kind of uh, models from this. So we touched on the limitations of the data that we've got to create those floating objects. So, um, you know, having better estimates of uh, debris generation from wind and trees and um, also things like rubbish and uh, fly tipping and, and stuff like that I think would be uh, a really big gap that needs to be filled um, and then the kind of the platforms themselves so one of the really big challenges has been bringing together so many different uh, models with different computing requirements into one place uh, and Robin's been working really closely with the Daphne team to uh, kind of in, you know kind of make changes to Daphne that are needed for doing something like this in real time so uh, I think one of the things that has changed during the project has been being able to actually run a loop of something rather than everything being in a, a linear process on Daphne so um, really there are improvements we made in all aspects of trying to do a challenge like this. Um, I think one of the really important things that's come out of it is also the communication between all of the different um, kind of uh, groups that have been working on it in areas of expertise so and um, we've got a really great team on pyramid and something that I think has been really important is to get everybody together in the same room really regularly so that we can try and talk each other's language and understand um, how all these models and data sets need to interact with each other so um, that's been a really uh, important aspect of doing uh, such a kind of broad scope project like this as well. It seems that in addition to the sort of fairly technical things you've mentioned about data and platforms which are absolutely critical of course you know you, you you're highlighting the importance and the challenges of constructing a digital environment of bringing 
the right people together to to address these complex challenges. And and I think the the nature of the composition of your your project that, that very interdisciplinary or bringing lots of different skills together. And and I think maybe the the challenge is is trying to find ways of ways of working actually for 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 these 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 sorts of these sorts of projects. And also I, I'm I'm detecting the that, that sort of policy science interface about how to get the right pitch to to provide the right information at the right time to to, to people to actually make use of this in 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 future applications any any other comments on on that from others just on a, on a related note to think having uh, although this is about flooding uh, last year we had a lot of drought and the the model that has been developed in pyramid i think could be applied to other environmental um, simulations or, or structures so having been through the uh the kind of these issues of data and <clears throat> uh working with uh, colleagues from different departments and different universities and, and varying data so data sources and model sources pulling them all together into some kind of analytical structure i think that could be applied to other other environmental problems on, on a similar platform so it's it's still a challenge but hopefully that there's a little bit of the challenges maybe being eased for for other similar projects well uh, Haley, i see see your hand up i, I was going to actually ask um how how these approaches could be applied in other areas so robin i think you've sort of started to address that drought being uh, an example but Haley, you you had a don't want yeah i mean i guess it's a more general point um but applies to this project and and other ones i've been involved in in the past but often we take these academic projects through to produce something as a kind of pilot um and it never goes anywhere so I think that in general, um, it would be good to see more funding to actually develop these sorts of systems through to, um, to useful operational tools, um, which I know there was, there was recently a software type call. Um, I, I can't remember it, from the research councils, but you know, there really does need to be more funding to actually move from just producing research projects to actually developing these sorts of systems into something useful for society, um, which which can't happen with the with the with the current funding mechanisms. Yeah. Thank so you. one of the things that I'm really proud of in Pyramid is that we've actually tried to do things properly in a reusable way. So that's been one of the amazing benefits of having a an actual research software engineer uh, on the project. Has been everything has been properly documented. Everything's open source and available on GitHub. The workflow, when we update the workflow or make any changes to any of the packages um, as part of Pyramid, it all gets pulled through automatically and tested and then incorporated automatically. So it's got a really, um, you know, relative to lots of other uh, kind of <laughs> science and engineering research projects, it's been really rigorously uh, done to make it as robust and as reusable as possible. And I think funding for that kind of tedious but <laughs> really, really important um, work is, uh, yeah, really critical. I think to making proper advances with stuff like this. Well, I see there's, a, I see there's a, a kind offer in the um, in the in the chat from Andreas. Thank you, thank you for that. And I think thinking about sensors, of course. Um, what about the citizen as a sensor? I mean, we we we're talking about flooding here affecting homes, businesses, people's lives. Um, is there an interest in in gathering information from citizens, citizen science, as it were, um, feeding into this sort of a tool? And what role do you think that might have? Yeah, so um, so we already have some kind of citizen science and community uh, science as part of this. So in some of the more rural areas in the time catchment, we've got um, data coming in from community groups. Um, and uh, but you just kind of have to be careful in how you handle that data because it requires special kind of quality control for it. Chua, do you want to say something about this as well? Yeah, I think I think uh, um, this actually I think uh, uh, again because in pyramid we we didn't really specify the you know, data source. We more or less collect data. I think we have been data you know from multiple sources that make the, the project really challenging. Actually, at Newcastle, I work for Newcastle, I think, uh, for 12 years. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I think we also involve another, you know, I think uh, a couple other projects, which is directly, I think, collect and make use of data from uh, from, from from citizens, like the tutors and also the photos and video, you know, they produce. 
And then I think uh, we got you know Shudong, and then you know I think a team uh, John Mills in here. They 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 develop you know the tool for example to identify for example the water depth velocity you know I think things like that you know or extend you know from the um, uh, from this kind of you know public you know or citizen information and then you know I think uh, yeah I think I think uh, that's a part of the source of the data but I think um, yeah I think uh, again you know I think there's lots of story going out in there but the quality it, it it's a big issue we need to deal with like Liz mentioned. I think uh, we have a, a huge volume of, of data, but and then we need a very, very careful um, uh, quality control to make sure the data it's uh, really in the quality we can really use, you know, for decision making. I'm just I'm just looking at the time. It looks like we're sort of unfortunately drawing towards the end of our fascinating discussion. I had a couple of sort of quick fire questions, really quick fire ones, if I may, just to sort of finish off with. And one is. Uh, you know, are there areas where the digital environment approach doesn't work, do you think? You know, we're, we're talking about digital environment enabling, facilitating, but are there, are there areas where perhaps it wouldn't work? And why not? <laughs> or maybe that's not the case. May, may I start first? Yes, please do, quickly. Yeah, obviously, I think when we talk about digital, you know, I think environment, we need digital. So I think uh, I can, I can see that, you know, again, this is kind of, you know, I think uh, I always view this as uh, technology for tomorrow, although, you know, I think uh, we should really expose, you know, this to stakeholders, you know, to decision maker, you know, what the technology available, you know, for future, you know, I think, uh, you know, for example, you know, for risk management, but like one typical example is like, you know, if, if you're in a low income country, they don't really have the infrastructure you know, or, you know, anything related, you know, in place. And then this kind of, you know, I think concept may not work, but not work for now, but that, that does not really mean, you know, not work for tomorrow. For example, I think uh, when, I, when I developed, you know, proposal, I think about eight, seven, eight years ago or, or, or 10 years ago, and then, and then one of the challenges, you know, in Nepal, for example, you know, the countries in Nepal, they say, okay, you know, there's there are not, not many people, you know, I think having, you know, mobile, mobile phone in there, but I think only if we Two, three years, you know, more or less everybody got mobile phone. That, that's a story. So I think uh, the technology may not be, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think in some places, but I think that's uh, for future. I think so. So so that comes to the question we, we discussed uh, just now is transferability. So the approach is transferable, but I think uh, may not have technology in place, you know, for this implementation now. There's no getting away from digital, is there? That's it's the future. All right. Thank you for that. And, and just really the, the final the final question is, this is a demonstrated project within the Construction and Digital Environment Programme. And, um, you know, just looking, looking back, I mean, it's still obviously underway, but just look, looking back, I'm interested in, you know, what, 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 if you could sort of characterize what, what are the best practices that, that you've been able to demonstrate and um, those learning points for others following in your, in your footsteps, what are the best practices that you'd like to point others towards? I think having a, a very close team and spending a lot of time in person with each other is really important um, for communication and uh, helping each other um, kind of transfer of skills and things like that. Um, and then probably uh, the kind of uh, documentation and testing and trying to make everything kind of uh, reusable and robust um, is really important as well for the legacy of it. Yeah, fantastic. Well, um, I think looking at the the clock it's about all we've got time for today it's a, it's a shame we could carry on talking about this for a, for a long time I'm, I'm sure i hope that's been interesting for everyone listening in as well um i'd like to thank sincerely all, all of you the panelists who've who've given up your time to come and tell us about this fascinating project i'd also like to thank the audience and you know the questions that that came in were, were great i managed to pass on some of those and i think looking at it some have been answered as well so that's Good. It's been a great discussion, really, about how digital environment approaches can be used to address pressing and complex issues. And of course, this follows on from other fascinating talks that we've already had, where the, the, the video is there if you want to go and watch. And of course, thinking about the, the, the future, um, we have the next webinar coming up on the Friday, the 2nd of um uh we have the next the, the, the next uh webinar in three weeks time which is the decide project so dr michael pocock and team will be speaking about delivering enhanced biodiversity information with adaptive citizen science and digital engagement so we'll learn all about his his team and their, their take on um citizen science will be very interesting so the video for today will be 
just to remind everyone on our YouTube channel, which is at, at NERC Digital Environment. Um, the the, the um, link is on the channel um, below. Do come and discuss things with us digitally. Um, the, the website for the CD program, um, the link is also, I hope, on the, on the chat as well. But uh, it remains for me just to thank again everyone who's contributed to the talk today and um, wish you a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you very much indeed.